Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 9 of Beaver Broadcasts. In this episode, directors Sam Ambrose and Buddy Deschler welcome Sam Huss, principal trumpet of the Richmond Symphony Orchestra in Virginia, and trumpet faculty at the Tidewater Brass Institute. Sam discusses his experiences as a symphony and gigging musician during the COVID-19 pandemic, including ways he has been working at home to continue to stay motivated in his personal practice and projects. Hope you enjoy! If we are truly live right now on Facebook, greetings to everybody that is out there watching, all of our friends and family and supporters and colleagues. We are joined today, myself and Buddy Deschler, joined by Sam Huss, who is the principal trumpet of the Richmond Symphony. He's also one of our trumpet faculty members here at Beva, started with us at the Tidewater Brass Institute um, last year. Sam, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Sam. Uh, really great to be here today. I'm excited to talk to you guys about some stuff, and thanks for that, that great introduction. Um, really quickly, uh, before we get into your session, which is titled Staying Motivated Through Cancellation, uh, could you tell us a little bit like about your background? Who, who is Sam Huss to you? That's a uh, tough question. <laughs> um, well, this is actually something I want to talk about as we get into to the, the conversation a little bit deeper. Um, cause this whole cancellation thing, our industry has kind of been on hold. So trying to define myself, at, like you asked is, is a little bit tougher. Um, but as my title says, I'm principal trumpet of the Richmond symphony. And for the most part right now, I'm just viewing myself as a at home musician. And I think that's, that's probably what I will say for the most part right now. Okay. Yeah. we we put ourselves with like these labels of, you know, uh, I go to this school or I'm even like majoring in this or like I'm in this orchestra or I'm with this organization. And now that, yeah, we're not as active, you know, about it. It's like, well, then who are we? But you still seem, you know, productive and, and active yeah. in your practice and your playing and like in good spirits and everything. So you're still defining yourself as a real trumpet player and a real musician. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the biggest thing for me is when, if you would have asked me this March 12th, the, the last day I, I got to play on stage in front of an audience, I would have said, you know, I'm, I'm principal trumpet of the Richmond Symphony. I'm an orchestra musician. And I went to Rice University for my master's, Eastman for my bachelor's. And I probably would have gone on to talk about how I have a private studio and all these things that were in motion at the time. But the, the thing that is like the underlying um, that goes around all that stuff that I'm really trying to hang on to is that I'm a musician and I play the trumpet and that's the stuff I have. That's what I have to hang on to through all of this stuff. Um, and the reason I, I picked motivation through cancellation as a topic is because I feel like this is where maybe I can help people out there the most rather than talking about how to win an orchestra audition or how to play in an ensemble or how to prep any of that stuff that we're, we're just not currently doing right now. And part of the reason that those things are all vitally important. And when we get back to it, I'll be more than glad to, to start sharing the, the experiences and the information I have. But for right now, I want to put an emphasis on staying motivated and adapting to the situation we're in. Because the thing that really frustrates me, um, there's like a, a cancel culture going on. You know, Coronavirus is scary and we all should be afraid and we all should wear our masks and do everything we can, even just for the sake of, I want to perform again, so please everyone wear your masks. <laughs> but beyond that, um, we're seeing seasons being canceled. We're seeing musicians being furloughed. We're seeing things that are really scary to read about. And for the most part, the industry is just not able to work or do anything right now. The stuff that we're doing is is very very limited like this this talk we're doing the first thing i've had that's like official and public since april and richmond symphony did a music marathon that was also live streamed in a similar way but one of the things i want to kind of talk about is ways i've seen people adapt and use that as kind of their their motivation to to kind of go forward yeah i think when <clears throat> this this started to to hit the coronavirus this was during the last 
leg of school. So in college, so maybe like late March, April. So people were coming back from a spring break and everything. So we were just finishing the semester and learning uh, a lot about it. And in music in general, we need to find motivation. Um, and when we look to our heroes and our, our people with positions that we uh, aspire to have, we look at like, well, what do you do? What is your practice regiment? How do you audition? But also like what gets you in the practice room all, all the time. And now after all of the Zoom calls, all of the guest master classes, all of this stuff, that is the big topic is how are you staying motivated at a time where you don't have to necessarily be preparing for this concert next week for Mahler five that's happening at like the end of the season and things like that. So maybe something that you can start to talk about Sam is, you know, when you wake up and there's not any sort of set work obligations because of this cancel culture that you're, you've referred to. So when you wake up or even like, just like throughout the week, what are your objectives? How are you processing and implementing your motivation? Yeah, so that's that's something that's been really kind of exciting for me, and maybe this is this is something I can share my view that will will help some people. But I I the first week I have I have some notes here that I I wrote like looking at March thirteenth when things started getting canceled. It was no more concerts, no travel. I lost all of the motivation outside of me inside these four walls of the practice room, and then I started to think. Okay, now what, obviously. And I remembered a time when that's all it was. It was back in like fifth or sixth grade, seventh, eighth grade, all those times when, yeah, you'd have band class, but if if you were a practicing musician, most of the time your band class would, would be challenging for a, the first couple weeks, and then you'd have the following five weeks where you're trying to get the whole band together where it's not really challenging. And the only way you're going to stay motivated is the practice you're doing at home. So I just started thinking about what kind of things got me to practice before I had a job, before I had requirements. What, what would I do when it was just me? And the first thing I started doing was I just started listening to music because I was like, well, I'm not score studying right now. You know, I'm, I'm not going to be playing Shostakovich Festive Overture at the beginning of May. Uh, so I guess I could probably just start doing things that I want to do. And that was a really hard question. That might be surprising. Um, and I, I'm sure that if there are some, some other orchestra musicians out there or college students, you might find yourself asking that question, what do I want to do? And you have to kind of really assess it because what do I want to do? Okay, I want to play in an orchestra. Well, you can't do that right now. What do you want to do with the trumpet? And for me, it, it became, well, a long time ago, I wanted to be a soloist. And the nice thing about being a soloist is you only need one person. <laughs> so I just kind of started picking up some, some pieces for solo trumpet to start off with. Um, I was kind of listening to some of my heroes like Hoken Hardenberger. Uh, a lot of his solo trumpet repertoire that's recorded out there is incredible. And then Somewhere along the way, he started the idea of recording a Charlie etude every week, which, in my opinion, those Charlie etudes, they feel like trumpet solos. Each, each individual piece is a book of 36 of them, or 32. 36, right? I'm going, to be, I'm going to be honest with you. I've been using those recordings for my own practice as well. Yeah. <laughs> they are fantastic. Yeah, they're, they're incredible. And... He, he is one of the people that I'm really looking up to in this time of trying to stay motivated through cancellation because, you know, he, all of his solo work has been canceled and all he can do is play by himself. So he's kind of going back to his roots. You know, he studied those things when he was in school and now he's presenting them to the world. You know, I'm sure these are things that, you know, you have teachers that tell you, at least I did, I don't care if it's an etude, it's a study. You should be performing it as, as if it's a piece of music. And he's going out there and proving that that can be done. And it's been like, I think he's on week 11 or 12. I think he did 12 this week. Um, and every week, it's, it just seems like he's, he's got something like new up his sleeve. It's, he's always very captivating when he plays. So for me, the, the first thing finding motivation was kind of switching gears from being like, okay, I'm going to prep this next concert to be as good as I can be to, 
I'm going to play for myself, for my own enjoyment. That's a huge mindset change for a lot of people, um, especially if you're in school, because you're kind of you're kind of geared to playing to the satisfaction of your teacher, because that's how you're going to learn the most from them. But I think it's this is a this is a really kind of unique opportunity for us to kind of say, okay, yes, we're going to check in with our teachers online and stuff like that. But a lot of the online teaching I've done, it's been kind of, it's been difficult. So what I've been preaching to all of my students is that, you know, you're accountable for yourself. Play how you want to. And if you're satisfied, chances are if, if you play to your own satisfaction, the person next to you is going to get some kind of enjoyment out of it. There's, you know, there's a, there's a famous Bud Herseth quote, and I'm not, I'm not going to get it exactly, but he says, play for your own satisfaction and others' enjoyment. That's, that's like his, his motto on, on everything. I, I, had a, I just moved into this new house. So I, have, I had a poster with it printed out on it, but it's not on the wall yet. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's kind of been my motto um, going into this, this period of, of canceled concerts. Um, so even, you know, I, I play in an orchestra. I did play in an orchestra and I still am employed by them. But one of the things I never really get to do is play jazz. And, and Buddy can attest at some of our Tidewater concerts. I really don't play jazz very often. <laughs> <laughs> You're in pretty good company, but uh, it's, yeah. nice. it's nice to be above somebody. So thank you for that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so one, one of the things I've been kind of able to do and, you know, kind of the advantage of not having an audience is I can practice jazz in the comfort of my own home. And other than my neighbors in my old apartment, no one really heard what I was doing. So I have time to kind of be, be in this workshop that's complete, completely safe from every critique but my own. And I think for me that that started to become more and more motivated because it was, okay, well, if we're stuck inside self-isolation, I'm going to kind of self-isolate my music a little bit and just kind of do what I want to, to make sure I'm still playing the instrument. I know one of the things that Buddy and I had talked about um, before, before this talk today is, you know, you take a day off, nothing bad happens. You know, it's, you kind of wake up and you, about 2 PM, you realize you haven't done anything. You thought, Oh, I missed it. Guess I'll try again tomorrow nothing bad really happens but i want to i want to kind of emphasize the importance of keeping a routine um on top of all of this you know trying to find motivation through listening and all this sort of stuff because i find that having somewhat some semblance of a routine is going to be vital in the long run um because we don't know how long this is going to last um and for me uh my routine started off, I didn't, I didn't want to think about trumpet first thing in the morning anymore because it was, I had the luxury of, I didn't have to do it. But what I did was I tried to make sure that I got my warm up in before noon. Um, that was, I thought that was a relaxed enough kind of schedule to put myself on that I'm being kind to myself through the quarantine, but I'm also enforcing that you got to do something. You can't just sit around all day. <laughs> Right. Well, I, I like that <clears throat> when we're talking about routines and, you know, we're musicians and this is a, a music webinar series, the Beaver broadcasts, but uh, your routine is about you as a whole and you like throughout the day. So like, you know, sometimes people, the first thing they do is they check emails. Some people, that's not the first thing at all that they do is check emails uh, first thing in the morning. So this routine is also about um, not just musical stuff, but, you know, personal stuff, identity stuff. Um, some people like exercising first thing in the morning and having that to latch on to. Yeah, like there's so many things that, that you had mentioned, Sam. Because I think I remember when when all of this started on, on your Instagram, my neighbors moved out. Uh, yeah. yeah. Is uh, you were just sharing favorite recordings like on your story. You were like, here's Jim Thompson in Montreal doing this. And like, here's this you know, soloist and all that stuff. Cause not only was it like, this is what I'm doing, but this is, you know, the gift for you too, is to be listening as, as much as you can. And yeah. So lots of, lots of really, really beautiful stuff. 
Yeah, and those those listening projects, they, they kind of fizzled off because I I kind of broke out into my my own projects. Um, and you know, I found I found inspiration through the recordings. I kind of held myself. I, ta- I have like a list of bullet points. What I what I kind of see is like self motivating. Um, and the first one I had is accountability, and I've already been talking about that a little bit. But I use I use kind of like the routine of waking up and listening and like finding inspiration, I held myself accountable for inspiring myself. And then I held myself accountable for warming up before noon. I just gave myself very simple parameters to kind of make sure I didn't fall off the horse. Because that's one thing I, I've, I've heard from people who, you know, they, they finish school and maybe they're, they're not quite doing what they want to do or they have a gap before they go to the next place that they're going to do something. And they say, yeah, I put the horn down. And then the next thing I know, it was nine days later and I had played. And I was like, okay, I hear that. And I'm, I'm like, I don't want that to be me. So I just started brainstorming about things I could do to try to try to combat that a little bit. And like I said, listening and then warming up. But the other thing that I haven't talked about yet uh, is kind of virtual networking. So when, when this thing started back in March 13th, that was like the first day that everything got canceled. I started thinking about, okay, well, you know, it's, it's, it's an outbreak. You know, they're saying two weeks isolation and everything's better. So I'm like, well, we'll probably be back by the end of the season. Cause I'm, I'm young. I'm optimistic. I'm hungry to perform. So I just contacted all my friends. I was like, Hey guys, let's, uh, let's do mock auditions for each other and just like record them and send. And then we can just kind of keep each other like on top of it. So when we come back to it, it's going to be lit. Like, we're so excited to do this. So that lasted about uh, five weeks, actually, which I was, I was pretty impressed that the group I had together that did that. Um, but that, that idea, I wanted to share that because mock auditions is definitely like an orchestra trumpeters kind of like thing to do. We're like, we're all ready for that next audition. But it doesn't have to be mock auditions. I think there were three of us out of that group that we, we switched it because we got so tired of playing excerpts thinking we're not going to come back to the orchestra. We just started saying, hey, someone pick a section of an etude that none of us have played and let's try to record it by Friday. And the, the group I have, I've, still been, I've been talking to all of them pretty much every day. But one of the things I've found is that if one of us like, hasn't kind of like reached out or like sent a video to each other in a couple of days, we're like, hey, do you guys want to do some kind of project or something? Like, we're just, we're trying to keep each other accountable. So that way it's not all on your, your own shoulders. You got a book club. And I know, yeah, it's like a book club. Yeah, that's great. Um, but that, that was hugely, hugely important for me, kind of making sure I, I, I feel active. Like, because there's, there's so much about music that is, it's a social aspect. Um, and this is especially for the younger students. I remember when I, I was in high school band, most of my friends were in band because we were friends and I was in band. It was one of those things where you're, you're doing something to be part of the group, part of the club. And still even musicians, you know, we have, we have a certain camaraderie with each other that we, we want to hold on to. Um, but like even even doing this today, seeing you guys, this is, this is all part of that stuff that's, that's keeping the music alive, even though we're in our homes right now. Um, and I would just, I would really encourage not being afraid to put the phone up on the stand, record something and share it to your friends, share it to your mom, dad, anybody who would want to listen. Even, even if you're doing like private lessons, share something to your teacher that you've been working on because music is about, sharing the art it's about performing right and we have to kind of figure out a way to do that for the time being um i was actually asked to do and this is a different kind of thing but it's still virtual virtual networking but kind of like a multimedia project like we've been doing with the with the beaver and um i got asked to do one with robert garrison was the guy who was leading the project but it was with a bunch of guys who like Chris Martin was there. It was kind of crazy. Uh, it was Thomas Pablavi. I don't know how to say his last name, but he's a soloist. I know Kenny DiCarlo. Um, a couple other people, Ryan Beach. But it was, it was a pretty stacked group. And he gave us this music and said, like, hey, guys, let's do this really hard project. 
and it was it was the infernal dance from firebird and it was like two weeks later after you know i spent like countless hours trying to get the get, get the right take for it but then we finally had a performance because we edited it all together and these kind of projects they were something i wasn't super comfortable with right off the bat so i was like well you know it's not the live sound you know we, we always want the live sound but none of this stuff is going to compare to that and it's not for me it's not about um it's not about trying to copy the live sound it's about just trying to keep new music being produced because otherwise we're going to kind of like put be put on the back burners yeah and especially now that more people have time to dive into some of these projects as well um you know we're constantly in this culture of not only feeling like we have to create but taking it the next step okay people are starting to figure out how to do these multi-tracking things and and simultaneously figuring out how to give more virtual performances what's the next thing absolutely yeah yeah, yeah and it's I'm sorry, sorry. Go ahead, Sam. no no you, you okay <laughs> the the thing that i've i've found is that there's a lot of information out there on how to do it and how to learn how to do it and that's that's another like bullet point in my my self motivation is learning new skills so not even just like on your instrument like me, I'm picking up jazz. That's definitely a new skill for me. I've really no idea what I'm doing, but you got to start somewhere. It's the same thing when I was doing these multimedia projects. And the first one I did um, was actually it was a it was just the brass trio, the plunk trio for the the Richmond Symphony Musicians page. Um, and then we did a bigger one, which had the whole orchestra. And that was the Simple Gifts video that got released back in I want to say early June. Um, I did the audio uh, editing for that, but the the thing about that is like it, it goes beyond like learning how to just play the pieces, but you're learning how to play into a microphone to get the right sound. You're learning how to add multiple sounds together, and these skills I feel like we're gonna we're gonna see kind of a, a bigger trend in people that are knowing how to edit their own stuff. We're gonna see better and better content coming coming through online, and I think that is these are the kind of adaptations that I feel are really important for musicians to be making right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for anyone that's just uh, tuning in now, uh, this is episode nine of the Beva broadcasts. And we're here with Sam Huss, principal trumpet of the Richmond symphony, as well as trumpet faculty for Beva, the brass institutes of Virginia. Um, I actually want to back up to something that you had said a lot earlier in case we have new listeners. Oh, and also for anyone that's watching now, um, if you have questions for Sam, please comment them below uh, on our Facebook page. Um, you were talking about sort of the similarity between you having a job in this orchestra, but everything being canceled, and when you were in school, because both of it was you had an idea of what you wanted to have in your career, in your life, um, but you weren't doing it. So you had this time in which to like think like, what is it that I really want to do in music? And then you get to be in that practice room. Uh, the only difference is this was, you know, the result of after, um, after COVID, but we're still talking about the unknown, which is always a super scary thing for, for people. Um, however, the unknown could yield a bunch of new positive things, not to be, you know, overly positive and optimistic about a global pandemic but it's it is kind of amazing it's like yeah i remember earlier in school where like my whole future was ahead of me and and you know it still is i should be you know positive thinking about that but, <laughs> yeah. um but the idea of like i wonder who i can be and what i can be in the future um so now so have you had talked about you know being a soloist a little bit more you um already do a bunch of stuff obviously with the orchestra and with chamber music and education and your teaching you have your private studio but you also have uh, the teaching for the brass institutes of virginia but has there been anything else that you've kind of um and becoming more of a jazz musician too um but it, what other things uh have kind of been in your new new sam uh now that we've been stripped of the identity of what our current employer is yeah so like, like I was saying about wanting to be a soloist when I was younger, um, I guess my 
like the new Sam. <laughs> that sounds weird. The the mo the motivation for me when I was in school, like when you know this whole idea about being an orchestra trumpet player was, you know, I I idolized Phil Smith. Obviously, a lot of young players do. He's just a re really great role model all all the way around. Um, but there are all other kinds of trumpet players that were so far from what fits in, inside of an orchestra um, that are fantastic musicians. And I, I find myself like listening to um, a lot of Clifford Brown lately and not, not even necessarily to learn jazz, but just like the actual sounds he could make on the instrument. They're so different than, than what I do. And just trying to like widen my, my palette of, sounds that come out like the color palette of sounds I'm, pr I'm producing so it's it's more of rather than focusing on specifically saying like i'm going to play like the best line held on that anyone's ever heard or my pictures on exhibition is going to have the thickest beefcake sound which you know that's that's a good focus when you're you're younger and you're trying to like fit that that orchestra kind of box that you have to you have to cross your t's and dot your i's to win an audition I started thinking about what kind of musician I wanted to be rather than kind of a role I was filling. Um, so I, tr I, tried, I tried to think about back when I wanted to be a soloist, you know, you, there was this line, I can't remember, uh, I think it was from Jens Lindemann, it was talking about when he studied with Mark Gould. And he comes into a lesson and Gould says, you want to be a soloist, huh? Well, what's your, what's your, What's your stick? You know, what's your hook? What 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 pulls the audience in? And Jens goes, I got a good tone. And in the Mark Gould way, he responded, he says, Well, I got a good tone. What else you got? You know, it, I it's it, I'm gonna leave it PG rated for now, but <laughs> you can just imagine what Mark Gould would have said. Please and thank um, you. Yeah. <laughs> but Jens uh, kind of sharing that story made me think about it. You know, I play in an orchestra. Cool. What else? You know, and I started thinking about like, okay, if I listen to jazz players and whether or not I can actually improvise or do any of that other stuff, can I like make my sound do the stuff that they're doing? Can I articulate the way they're doing? If I listen to this new music that has like crazy jumps in it, am I able to do all those kind of things? It it goes it goes more of just like a different focus rather than trying to like redefine myself. I'm trying to expand as a musician rather than just, you know, saying like, well, wait till the pandemic's over. You're going to hear a completely different player. <laughs> so, so speaking of that, like, obviously we, we can't possibly predict when it's going to be over. For instance, when, you know, you're going to have your full season back or even like remotely close to what you consider that. Um, but I'm sure even through this, you know, it sounds like you've been evaluating how you do things. You know, obviously you're, you've got a little bit more time, like you said, to get through your morning routine and maybe not rush your way through or have to get straight to practicing, but you have more listening time. Um, what kind of things that you're taking now, whether it be, you know, playing in different genres or experimenting more or whatever, that do you think you'll be able to fit into what will hopefully be a little more normalcy down the road. So, so, so it, yeah. In other words, maybe what are you taking out from these new experiments or perhaps even just giving yourself some time in the morning? Um, are there different things that you can fit into what was your old routine or perhaps the time into that? Yeah, I find that um, now I have... I have to spend a lot less time kind of fixing my face, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Um, so you play orchestra concerts, like one of the last concerts we did was Pines of Rome. And by the end of the weekend, it was like, okay, well, my lip, my top lip is like this big and I have to try to figure out how to get it back in the mouthpiece and vibrating. I don't have to do that. So I'm finding myself like my warm up is about, a third as long as it used to be because it's just kind of okay I'm, I'm ready and I don't really play to the point where I'm like totally fatigued anymore um and I guess like one of one of the things I'm I'm hoping will kind of carry on from this back to when we return to normal 
is I'm going to be a little bit more comfortable with when I go from being fresh to being tired and knowing where that line is, because right now I can like really feel it. I, I'm very aware of where, yeah. where the fresh lip stops. <laughs> um, but another thing I've found is that when I'm, and I, I actually feel kind of guilty admitting this, but um, I find now because there isn't kind of like, there's no conductor on the podium telling me that was too much. That was too far. I find that I like, I play a lot more exaggerated on my own than I would in the orchestra and whether or not it's like correct or not, <laughs> you know, I'll listen to like a recording of Timothy Dockstitzer and he's got crazy vibrato because his, I think his dad was a violinist or something. Um, but you listen to him play like uh, Zygunda Weizen and he's playing it like a violin it's like very bouncy and when he gets to like the really singing parts it's like really really thick hand vibrato and you hear that coming out out of out of the trumpet and you know just picking i just bought that piece because i was like oh i'm really inspired to, to learn this doing that vibrato is something i've never done before but i started thinking about it. i was like well what if i did that on something like don juan in the orchestra nothing's gonna stop me really from having like an overly you know, uh, what do you call it? Russian romantic vibrato on there. Maybe a conductor would say that was a bit much, but if I present him something that's like way farther than I've ever gone before and he asked me to do less, then maybe I'm coming back to a tasteful position that's a lot farther than I would have if I never stepped out that far. So one of the things I guess like, and the, the thoughts kind of forming now that you asked me that question, <laughs> but even beyond like the, the physical things about the trumpet that I'm hopefully still developing that will carry on. I'm like developing this kind of like hunger and thirst to be as expressive and as musical as possible because I haven't been able to share any of it. It's just kind of like been bottled up. So I feel like when, when we get back out there, it's just going to be, I'm, I'm hoping that my colleagues and, and myself will be able to just share the most intense music making experiences that we've ever had. And that's, that's for me, that's the biggest motivator is that when, when we were finally returned to that stage and I shared a video about uh, the Paris, the national Paris symphony, I think is what it was um, returning to the stage. They had like a three minute applause before they even started playing a note. And I just think about if the audiences are waiting for it that much, that's like such an emotional thing for me to think about. We should be just as, just as like emotional about wanting to perform for them. Um, so that's, that's one thing I kind of hope I, I carry, I carry with me. And it's not like first two weeks we get back and we're all like really singing, really going for it. And then, you know, two years from now when things are kind of like, I mean, we don't know what the normal is going to look like. We don't even know when this is going to be over, but if it does return to like a more normal concert pattern, I hope that this, this, this like willingness to, to really go for it lasts. Yeah, and it's and I think it's really great to see too. You know, especially during this time where a lot of us have been quarantined. You know, kind of high in hiding since mid March, even and and some even before that. You know, it's easy to see motivation die out as that goes out, but um, it's really encouraging to see how not only are you ready to get back out there, but you're ready to get back out there almost in a new light and, and in a new presentation, not only of yourself, but of, of your craft. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure you can agree, agree symphony orchestras uh, struggle already throughout the country, just being able to present themselves and connect with their audience. So just having all of their members and, you know, constituents ready to serve their community, everything is really, really encouraging to hear and see. Yeah, and that's, that's something, too, that even beyond the individual that I hope organizations stay motivated through all this cancellation. Because um, like I, was, I was talking about cancellation culture, you know, where we're seeing, we're seeing some orchestras where they cancel all the way through to July of 2021. And it's, it's heartbreaking to know colleagues that are, are, are experiencing that and going through it. Um, obviously, it's, it's in the best interest of, of health and safety, but you know, it's it's you don't it's a it's just such a conflicting feeling with all that. Um, but you also, on the other hand, you see orchestras that are presenting 
kind of like socially distanced performances where you're seeing, you know, living room concerts. You're seeing, I think I saw one orchestra doing, it was like Bach before bed and you have like some of their string members playing some Bach around, around bedtime. <laughs> and there's just all these really creative ideas to, to adapt and keep the orchestras, you know, relevant in today's society. And I think that is one, you know, one positive thing you could, you could say from, from things being canceled is that orchestras are being forced to adapt to stay alive. And if they aren't adapting, they're closing. And that's, that's what's really hard to see. But it also is kind of proving that there are ways for us to, to be creative and kind of come together virtually to, to keep the music going. Yeah, we had um we had a talk with Joe Levinsky, um, horn player from retired from the Army Band, but principal of Maryland Symphony and uh, you know DC Ballet and and everything, and he was so active as an orchestral musician and when he was in the military and even as a soloist and everything, and one of the things that we had talked about was that the, the offering that we're trying to give to music uh, from our perspective to our audience still trying to offer something. Um, but our outlet has changed significantly. And when you look at, uh, any orchestra of any city of any community, that's what it's about is it's about serving its community. And now rather than, you know, just shut off all the lights, like it's, it is nice to see so many organizations attempting to still provide for their community, still try to reach their audiences, um but not just like through the outlet but also through the programming of their outlet so it's like yeah you can't get the entire orchestra together every single time uh and if you do want to record something as a full orchestra with all that mixing and like all of the different video files and audio files like it would take so long to do that every week uh or to do that multiple times a week so you are seeing more chamber more soloists more just recitals if like or if like two people are married and like, you know, they live together. So it's like, here's two cellos or, you know, violin and piano or something like that. So um, it kind of leads me to uh, a conversation I want to have because for anyone that's not in a symphony orchestra, um, we are just viewers and readers of headlines um, seeing like they're canceled through this. They're like, they've closed down this. Um, musicians furloughed for, or, you know, all of this, the, these different headlines and news. Um, so to the extent in which you're comfortable and able to, uh, would you, because you have been doing some things and you have already talked about some of the engagements that the Richmond Symphony has done. Can you talk about, you know, from an actual orchestral musician, you know, going through this, like the kind of um, news or updates or activities that you uh, are participating in? Yeah, so I will say that all these activities are going to vary from state to state and it's very dependent on what the local government advises. You know, like when we had in Virginia, the whole state went to phase three, which would have allowed us to perform in front of a live audience. But the mayor Stoney of Richmond delayed our opening to phase three, like a week or so. And that was, that was like rate and crunch time for us because our season was set to end June 20th. Um, or 21st, it was the 20th, but it opened up and then we had four days of the season left to do any kind of project. So our management has been absolutely incredible and they've been, they've been so creative and forward thinking about all this stuff that when we got to those last four days and we were in phase three that they stipulated it, uh, performances could happen, but the musicians needed to be 10 feet apart. You couldn't have. I can't remember how many people were allowed in the building, but they looked at all those rules and they said, okay, we can do chamber music recordings. We're going to, we're going to make this happen. So I haven't seen any of the final prod like products yet, but the brass quintet went in and we recorded three different pieces. One of them is going to be like an education thing. And then the other two, I'm sure will be promotional materials, but it was like, the coolest thing when you're you're thinking about everyone's stuck at home we don't know when we're going to go back to work and we were actually able to finish our season it was like oh my gosh my organization like i just like i wanted to cry i was so happy i was going back to work i remember just like 
parking my car where, you know, I designated spots I could be walking in. Everything was like, you know, no, you know, couldn't touch anything, mask on, walk directly to your chair, sit down and play, which was really weird um, based on like what your habits are walking into your normal place of work. But it was just so special once once you got through all that stuff and you're sitting down and you're in the middle of a, of a piece of music. It was, it, I mean, it was, I, I mean, it gave me so much more energy. And I'm, I'm sure that probably helped with my staying motivated through cancellation <laughs> more so than anything else. That, that brief moment, that glimpse, that glimpse yeah. of it all. Well, thank you so um, much. Oh, sorry, keep going, Sam. Well, as I, I, I actually would like to add that one of, the other things that the Richmond Symphony is doing right now, if any of you guys are interested, uh, there's, there's, you won't see any trumpet in the next couple of months, but they have, um, they're doing their summer concert series where they're doing all Beethoven programs and they're actually live streaming them. Uh, I think they, they have like tickets that you get access to. So they've, they figured out how to, how to make it work to present concerts this summer, which is pretty cool. And I'm hoping that that momentum means that in September, October, November, we start to see more and more of, of this kind of thing happen. And that, you know, this, this idea about creating concerts for the community that are viewable online helps other orchestras out there stay afloat. Cause it's, it's, you know, we're, we're not a tiny community, but we're also not a huge community of, of musicians. And I think like the whole sharing ideas to, to keep the, the entire industry alive is going to be really important. Very, very good thoughts there. Well, um, thank you very much for all of that awesome insight. It's been really inspiring, I know, for myself and hopefully for all of our listeners and viewers out there to hopefully that you can stay motivated in whichever way that you are, whether that be musically or artistically or professionally or personally. Uh, Sam, you know, on behalf of everybody here at the Beaver faculty, we always love having you around talking. Uh, there is one thing we got to get to before we head off here. And I'm pretty, you know, it's we're almost 145 here. So you've definitely warmed up. Uh, <laughs> it's becoming a bit of a tradition here that uh, all of our guests on our shows and our broadcasts sign off with their heartiest mouth trumpet. So if you're not familiar uh, with what that is, uh, Buddy, I think I know you're in Arizona, but you've probably warmed up by now. I know you're drinking coffee by about three in the morning. Okay, I'm good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the mouth trumpet. So whenever you're ready, if you can give us your best and hardiest. <laughs> Oh, perfect. <laughs> Stellar. <laughs> a true principal player right there. Uh, once again, on behalf of everybody here at Beva, Fred Brass, and Tidewater Brass Institutes, uh, thank you all for joining us uh, with our Beva broadcast. Uh, tune in tomorrow, Thursday at 1 p.m. We're going to be having a live interview and Q&A session with David Federley, who's a retired uh, tubist for the Baltimore Symphony. And he also teaches at the University of Maryland. And thank you all very much for supporting. Please like, share, and have a great day. Thank you again to Sam Huss for joining us today on Viva Broadcast to talk about how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected him as a performing musician. If you would like your product or school to be featured on our broadcast, please reach out to me, Dakota Corbliss, Director of Operations, at dakota at fredbrass.com. And we'll be sure to set it up. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next time.